Paul Slush began his training in the martial arts in the 1970s, and by the mid-1990s was the most prolific martial arts instructor in San Diego. Scott served as Paul's assistant from 1992 through 2003 before going on to create the Libre Fighting System. They both started out in Tang Soo Do before finding the Filipino martial arts in the early 1990s. talk about um your training back in the very beginning like what got you into it um why did you start and what was the culture like back then i was the typical kid that got beaten up every day uh, uh in my um back where i my hometown my bully lived across the street uh let's just say i was about uh seven and this kid was about a couple of years older than me his name was Ivan, and he had one eyebrow that raised up like this, like Mr. Spock. So the nickname was One-Eyed Conniving Ivan. Okay, Ivan, I, Ivan would beat me up to the point where, like, I go sitting at the dinner table, and I look like a different person each night. I sit down, fat lip. Next night, sit down, black eye. I sit down, other eye, black eye. You know, and then I had an older brother, uh, rest his soul. Um, he pretty much fought my battles, uh, for a good long time. He'd go right across the street, politely knock on the door. The kid would answer. My brother would grab him and put him in the hospital. It is a typical story, which will, will lead me to teach. If you get your butt kicked enough times, man, you can only kick a dog so many times. So anyway, speed the clock forward, eighth grade, first day, all the kids are coming in and going to their, uh, their sections, horns, this and that. I see this kid walking towards me, spinning, spinning a drumstick in, in his hand, in one hand, and he had something under his arm. I said, what's that? Oh, uh, that's my gi. I said, what's a gi? Oh, I, I practice karate. I said, oh, okay. So anyway, that kid goes into my list of people, okay, influ influential people uh, in my life and changed my life because he introduced me to my first instructor. And my life changed, man. Okay, because that was uh, civilian military going in there. Um, there's enough information out there to know that I didn't have a real good uh, relationship with the guy. But the thing about it is, it was a business relationship. The man was dangerous, and he he was he was just well known. Uh, and I was the youngest. My friend who got me in there and my myself were 14 going in there. Everyone else was in their 20s and 30s, and the, it was just a different atmosphere in the 70s because you know Vietnam had just stopped the war, and a lot of the a lot of these guys uh, uh, came over from Southeast Asia, and they were wearing you know and they pop in, and you know they they just have this hard intensity to them, and it, it's it's a process as far as when you go into um, a setting like that with such aggression you're the victim of it for a long time until you get used to it and then you learn to dish it out like now you they bring they advance you to levels um and that's where your discipline uh, uh grows and your confidence and everything like that it, it really is a, a, a magical thing uh, i was lucky to get into with that outfit because uh you know those guys taught you how to survive they really did and that's what i needed at that point the type of tournaments that we had in that day, um, LA were the guys you didn't want to mess with. They had, uh, oh my God, the Black Karate Federation of VSK of Vermont Square. Um, uh, oh my God, they they come, these dudes would come in hoods. And I mean, like walk around like months and you're going, oh my God, man. <laughs> okay, and, and um, uh, they you witnessed breaking bones, breaking noses. Uh, you know, there was no, um, you know, the, the, the control factor, you just saw such fabulous technique guys would get in there and of yeah, yeah, no, no, man. These, we had this dude, uh, I can't say his name. His name was Ray. Okay. Ray would beat his opponents with techniques. I mean, it was amazing to watch this dude. He would, you know, that's how good the, the level of study and the level of training was in that day. All it, it's not like today. You will see a guy with 10 stripes on his belt. Oh, well, this is dangerous. No, he's dropping everything. He's an idiot. He can't kick above his, his leg or whatever. It was rare to see somebody with three stripes on their belts. 
And you better know that person put in years and, and, and put in his, his, his dues. And those are the people you wanted to train with. And, and they were known, they were known. It, it, it was just a different atmosphere. No phonies, you were found out very quickly. Yeah, they would show up at your school in that era. That's if, right. If you were lying, someone would show up and challenge you and beat the shit out of you. That's and right. And tell everyone around town about it. That's right. You didn't laugh. Apparently you witnessed a challenge fight with your instructor. Oh. I don't think we <laughs> talked about that. Oh, man. Oh, well. well. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. It, there, this was uh, it was a private. Uh, it, it ended up being that a master, a guest master, came to our studio, and there were just three of us there. Uh, my a couple of my, but the guy who got me into karate, my good buddy, and uh, another guy that was there. The doors were closed. Nobody come in the office. So anyway, we knew something was wrong, but it would. But you know, it's not like my instructor said anything. But we know him, and we know his mannerisms. So his back was to us and the other master squared off and he did this kind of snake thing. Was that the other master he said? The other, I'm sorry, the other master got into a stance and started doing the snake, the hand thing, okay? And uh, all I saw was, okay, first it started out like my instructor just dropped down. He'd always just, just drop down to stay there. This man moved in with the snake thing and he, pow, okay? And he, he just lighted, boom, okay, and blew him back. And then we're just like looking at each other and looking down because we go, oh, that's going to be bad. And my instructor turned around and he rolled his eyes at us. So now we know, oh, God, man, this guy's going to get it. Okay. You know, because like now we know our, our instructor is being irritated. And so anyway, uh, it got worse from there because they squared off again. Each blow, man, um, my master took him down like, like he took him down with, with a scissors. He, he punched him down and it just got harder and harder until, uh, you know, they had to maintain control as we're looking, but we're also started laughing and we shouldn't have done that, man, because he got cracked one good time, like, pow, in the road. Okay, we, we just put our heads down. Okay, so yeah, that, that didn't last too long, but that was the first time we kind of saw, wow, dude, that's what he looks like when he's trying to hurt you. Okay, so yeah, that was the truth. Instructors weren't exactly like Crease in that they weren't <laughs> sociopathic, but they were more Crease than Miyagi. Like, it wasn't a lot of like yeah. old school wisdom and a lot of, uh, you know, this is the art. It was like, you're here to learn to fight, act like it. It takes um, a lot of patience to, to learn old school. That's why Kung Fu takes so long. There's so, you know, it takes so long to get a, a black sash, man. It, it, you know, there's, a lot of history and a lot of everything like that. A lot of people don't have that kind of patience. Yeah, and the thing is, like, no one was caught. Like, even if you were, like, a small, if you were, like, eight years old, you know, you got, like, reprimanded and had to do push-ups and you started crying. It wouldn't be like, hey, buddy, come here. Hey, you understand? I'm just trying to help you out, man. I'm trying to make you tough, you know? There was none of that shit. It would be like, what's the problem? That's counterproductive. And they, they would even call children Mr. Right. What's the problem, Mr. Smith? Are you hurt? Ten more push-ups, you know? And, like... Like, like Paul said, you didn't talk once you stepped on the floor. Like you, before class started, you would line up according to rank silently and start stretching. It was the senior instructors or the senior students' job to make sure the the ranks were lined up evenly and spaced out, and everyone was doing the job, and to jump everyone's shit if they weren't. Like if you look at the scenes that take place in the Cobra Kai dojo, um, in the Karate Kid movie, not the Cobra Kai series. That's about seventy percent accurate to how a good school was run back in that era. Everything was precise. Everyone was lined up exactly how they should be. Uniforms were pressed and clean, but your uniform always looked like it had some miles on it. Like it looked like it had been washed a million times, <laughs> ironed a million times. And like when you see their uniforms, those are like the uniforms you would wear to like a demonstration. That's not what you would train. And your, your uniform would look like broken in. You drop someone, uh, like I said before, the guy who got dropped uh, should have been able to take that shot and didn't, he would have been doing pushups. If the guy had kicked harder than, uh, especially because he outranked the other guy, if he had gone too hard and dropped him or had intentionally dropped him, he would be doing push-ups. Or if the two had just gotten carried away and started sparring too hard and someone got dropped, they both would have been doing push-ups. Someone probably would have been doing push-ups, at least in my classes, <laughs> if you hit the ground like that. Like I, There was a time where one of my classmates had, a real, had an oversized gi that his mother, because we were all broke as shit. And he, his mother had tailored it, but was for made for a much bigger kid. And so he had these real baggy sleeves. And I was sparring with him, 
And I threw a roundhouse kick and my foot went into his sleeve and he freaked oh, out no. and he raised his arms and jumped back. And he pulled me off of my feet and I landed back first on the ground, knocked the wind out of me. And I had to do push-ups because I should have broken my fall. Periodically through that class, they would say, you know, come to attention, fix your uniform. And you turned your back. This was a, you could only face away from the front of the studio if you were adjusting your uniform. Mm -hmm. And you did one tug here, one tug here, tied your belt, and then turned back around and stood at attention. If they said at ease, you either stood with your hands here, your hands on your belt, your hands behind your back, or you could go down and start punching the ground to condition your knuckles or stomping the ground to condition your feet. That was how you relaxed in class. That's at ease. Yeah, that was at ease. Mm -hmm. um, wow. Everything was done in, in unison. Uh, you spoke in unison. You moved in unison. Everything was push-ups. You didn't key eye loud enough. Push-ups. You turned too slow. Push-ups. You did the wrong technique. Push-ups. You forgot a form. Uh, forgot part of a form. Push-ups. If the instructor was going to demonstrate something, you would call someone up, run to attention, bow, get in a stance, get ready to feed the instructor. And the instructor would always hit you kind of hard. Because you knew you were going to get beaten, no one really liked to be the dummy. But it, like if you like went, you know, anything like that, like that, you would be doing push-ups or like until you couldn't move your arms anymore. You couldn't show any sort of hesitation. You're expected to feel honored that you were about to go get your ass kicked. Um, <laughs> if if the instructor felt you were slacking in class, they would either drop you in sparring, then make you do push-ups for not taking the blow properly, or we would do stomach conditioning where you would stand in front of each other with your hands behind your back and you would trade roundhouse kicks, what we call turn, turn kicks in Tom Sudo. Uh, you would trade shots to the stomach and your instructor would pair up with you and he would just kick you hard enough to drop you. We would get in a big circle and you would turn to your left and you kick the person next to you and you go around a big circle that way and then it would go around the other way. You knew you were fucked if the instructor lined up next to you where you would kick him first and he would kick <laughs> Because that meant you were getting fucking dropped. Um, or kicked hard enough that you learn like, hey, stop, slap. There was, there was very little discussion like, hey, you're not doing a good job. You need to step it up. You need to be an example. You just got beaten and were expected to figure it out. And this was true of like children, you know, like what they did to us would be considered child abuse by, by today's standards. This is even my grandmother would bring me to class. She'd be like, why are you doing this to yourself? Yeah, and I got like, that. It, it was because I was, yeah. I was uh, the smallest kid in a bad neighborhood. I grew up in a trailer park on the outskirts of San Diego. There was a lot of drugs and a lot of violence and cops were always in the neighborhood and I was getting my ass kicked all the time. And like, sound familiar? <laughs> it made you hard. They hardened you up. It, it just made you tough. I remember this dude took a stick. I was, um, I was, I had a stick and I didn't even know this cat was around. And I was just banging on stuff and just, you know, I didn't even know he didn't know where he just came up on me with a stick. And he looked at me and he said, I'm going to beat the shit out of you with this. He goes, man, come on. You got your stick and I got mine. And I this, I swear, made me work harder than anybody training. This will never happen again, ever. And it was burned into both of our heads when we worked weapons. Never drop your weapon. Never, ever drop your weapon. Okay, I dropped my weapon. I was I was in fear of this person beating me up this before I knew anything. Okay, then he dropped his, and then pow! Okay, nailed me. Okay, and then he saw I wasn't going to do anything, and then he said, uh, "Now, if you tell anybody, I'm a mess with you, and if you don't tell anybody, I'm a mess with you." Now, what are you going to do with that? Okay, so anyway, I was like, "Oh wow, you know, wow." Okay, talk about going to your grave with something. But that's that's what what you you have to have something happen to you to make you train like an animal to make it never happen again ever and it won't and it has I had just gotten my green belt it was graduation and I just man you know okay so we're proud and green is a middle rank and I just got mine and now you know I'm like yeah right okay so now it's like all right everybody pair up everybody pair it up okay now we're sparring okay and we we go you know pair 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 and my instructor got in front of me. And, and uh, all right, here we go. Okay, it's like, God, okay, they always wait for you, and then you have to make the first move. You knew you were going to get hurt. You knew it. Okay, because he didn't pull his putt. Like, like he, he it, it's a thing. It's a thing with, with our present instructor. Okay, the, the, they're, it's a combination of they're proving a point that you're not going to lay a hand on them, and they're daring you to lay a hand on them. 
uh, but but in a uh, kind of in a tutorial type of way, but then in an ego type of type of way. They're kind of intermixed. So I went into him. He goes, "Come on, come on, green belt." That was the last thing consciously I remember him saying. <laughs> he did a he did a jump spinning back heel kick into my temple. Wham! Okay, and I swear it was like the cartoons. My head went. Ee! Okay, like one time and he kicked me so hard and I just went down. I went down, man. I was I was unconscious for a little while, and so they they took me they, they carted me off into the dressing room and laid me on the bench. And man, like I came to, and my eye was was crooked. It was crooked. Okay, you know, and and I go, oh my god. Okay, you know, and, and um, I go, oh man. He comes back there and he looks, no, no, yeah, Mr. Slush, uh, you know, let's have a look. You know, like, a, uh, uh, that doesn't seem to be lining up right. Uh, come on. <laughs> no shit, Sherlock. I mean, you know, come on, man. I mean, you know, how's your heel? Okay, does it have half my temple on, on your heel? Okay, so, so man, so, okay. And then, oh, I knew my dad was coming. And so, you know, that's when, you know, uh, that's when you, oh, well, you did this to my kid. Man, I could hear my dad coming into the, into the office. And uh, my instructor went out, and I could hear his voice. Oh, yeah, you know, uh, I'm uh, lining up uh, the way we like. Uh, you might want to, <laughs> like, you know, like, rub some dirt on it. It'll be okay. Oh, okay. So anyway, I went home like that. It straightened out. But oh my god, man. Okay, it was. I would always come um, uh, home with injuries like that. One was a lump behind my ear that my ear was sticking out like this, looking like Opie Taylor. Okay, in, in uh, uh, Andy Griffith. Okay, like like. You just, you took your lumps and learned from it. <laughs> okay. That's, that's how it was. Punishment was a big thing. And there was, it was not like it wasn't fair. It was to make you learn and you needed to understand that it's easy. It wasn't fair. Even Well, nah, dude, look, man, that dude out in the street who has a knife or a gun. And it, I, it, it led me to train the way that I, uh, excuse me, to teach. My students, when we do bag work, okay, um, like I'll get you on that bag and have you savage the bag, and I'll walk up like because I'm walking in rows, I mean, you know, deep rows, get everybody. You don't let him take your money? Yeah, you know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just did this to your mom. Yeah, he just did, you know, and I'd be talking in their ear, and they just be getting more aggressive to this. It's part of my aggression training, okay? And that's how you have to be. If anyone attacks you, you have to match aggression with aggression, period. Period. You have to end it right there. You have to. You have no choice. There is no. The only other alternative is that they're going to get you. See where I got this shit from? <laughs> yeah, a good instructor is an instructor that will tell his students, um, I want you to be better than me. Okay. And a good instructor is an instructor that will share everything with their students, not hold back like the guys that we love to take apart. Okay. Who just all mouth. And they'll go ahead and bash their students. But, uh, you know, it's like that's counterproductive. All right. Uh, I know that sounds like a contradiction for what I went through. But no, it was a different planet I was on. You had a choice. Do you accept this or not? Okay. And the thing is, this man I saw, you, you, he's, he's known, man. Regionally, this guy's known. And, I mean, he, every tournament he goes in, okay, you, you see the savagery in him. It's what I wanted. It's what I wanted for, to survive. Okay, so I got as close to him as I could. Everything he did, every the way he, he, he the way I trained, he, I, he comes out of me. I swear, I use this line in my class, and I make sure to tell everybody where it came from. So you know, I, I'm not trying to look brilliant. The guy was striking matches and then putting them out with his fingertips. He's striking matches, putting them out with his fingertips. Okay, so his buddy. Said, eh, you know, you're, you're, you're daft. What are you doing? Eh, eh. And he goes, we'll try it. Okay. So anyway, his buddy did it. And he went, ow. He said, it bloody well hurts. He said, of course it hurts. He goes, and then his buddy said, well, what's the trick? And Peter O'Toole looked right at him. He said, the trick is, William Potter, is not minding that it hurts. I never forgot that. Because that's the mindset you'd have to do. That's what Scott and I did. And I won't jump ahead. <laughs> But when we trained, see, Scott and I were achieving our, 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 we're raising our own bars as the years went by. Man, we're pushing each other. Got hurt along the way. But the thing is, you have to play mind tricks with yourself. We actually got to the point where, like, Scott cracked me. Man, Scott always, man, every time he'd always hit me in my fingers and, and just, just whack. 
Oh, God. Okay, like that. We would practice thanking each other. Each time we heard each other, oh, God. thanks, man. Ah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, play a mind game with it. Okay. Like then we you go were, right in. We were thanking each other for tough. Right, right, right. Like, thank you for hurting thank me. It's like tough. Right, right. It doesn't make sense, but only to us. Yeah. I still do it with my class in San Diego. Too. Right. You got to play games with that, man. If you're serious about martial arts like we are, you take it to the crazy level. That's how you get crazy good. That's it's as simple as that. Okay. Well, so I wanted to roll back a little bit. Um, Paul, like how, how many years are, all right. When did you start teaching before you met Scott? Yeah. Teaching. Yeah. Yeah. 92, uh, uh, June, June, uh, January of 92. We started doing Filipino martial arts in, uh, June, July, June or July of 93. Paul had done a little bit before me. Um, we started training together in Filipino martial arts in the summer, early summer of 93. Wait, so when did, when did you guys meet? 92. I met like his second week of teaching, mm -hmm. like right at the beginning. Oh, uh, okay. So this is, so how did, so, all right, this is second week of teaching and you had 150 kids. Like yeah. how did the, how did that happen? Let, let me, let me explain this. The business I was in uh, is a rather unique. It originated in Tennessee with this guy who came over here with his three kids and his wife in a broken down RX-7. Okay. I needed a job at that point. Cause see the chronology goes, when I left my first instructor, it's time for me to go to school. Okay. So junior college and then the university. So I ran into the Filipino uh, uh, martial artists while I was at uh, San Diego state and pulled together about a year with those guys. Okay. So, you know, so I had to do the school thing, man, and then graduate. And then I got pretty much odd jobs for a couple of years. And then I saw a little ad in the paper that said, uh, black belts wine, good pay. That's it. And so anyway, I called the number and, oh, yeah, hey, guy, talk like this. He's in Missouri. <laughs> hey. Okay. And so anyway. Wait, so he, it didn't even say like black belt and what? It, it just, no, he just no, wanted a black it. belt. Okay. Oh, you got to understand. You got to just <laughs> listen to how this, this goes out. I find out that, okay, this dude, he said, meet me at Denny's. I said, Denny's? What's this all about? So I meet with him. It's a drug deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, what the hell? Okay. And so I and I did ask him because see, I have in my mind what I went through. Oh well, man, what is this? And, and he's talking about yeah, you know, he all he did he talk. Yeah, you know, well, best mind truck makes 700, 800 a week. Ain't no, ain't no, ain't no, ain't no. I'm all like, oh my god, is this some kind of like tear thing or something? No, it was rather brilliant. It's just that the way he has to say it, he has to show it to you. Uh, he said, okay, you're going to meet me at this elementary school. Okay. Now I'm there. I'm tapping my foot. Where is this guy? Here comes the dude in his RX seven with a bunch of uh, black bag, black uh, trash bags in the stuffed in the back. He gets out. How you doing? How you doing? <laughs> okay. So anyway, we're going, Hey man, okay. What's the deal? Now he just goes through the motions and what happened next is amazing. Um, okay, why don't y'all just grab a black bag? Okay, like that. Okay, like that. Look in the kick pads and uh, mouth guards, shin guards, hand pad. Okay, all right. Uh, he had the key to the place. Open up the utility door. Okay, to the utility room. That's a big room. All right, all right. Now y'all grab the tables. Set the table up here. Now I want y'all set those chairs up right up here. It's just we're just doing what he says. Okay. Arm and army showed up. And army <laughs> showed up. Okay, it had to be uh, it had to be at least a hundred and sixty kids with their parents and with you, you can imagine what the crowd looked like. It's uh, it in order to really you know make the money he was talking about. You needed to have like one hundred fifty kids at least in your um, in your uh, uh, school. I had four schools. And for at least six or seven years of the 12, seven, at least six, seven of that I taught, I had 200 kids, okay, that show up. And that's splitting that into four classes, four 40-minute classes, and then adding a fifth class, okay? So you start with the little white belts, then the bigger white belts, then your little colored belts, your medium-sized colored belts, your adult colored belts, then you get to the black belts. I wasn't tired by the time I left, okay? So, so uh, that, how, how the guy got the numbers to answer your question because it's a good <laughs> there, there's more to this story but the the crux of this before we blow past that this 
is he would rent spaces from schools. And part of the deal was they would advertise his club, the class to the students. This guy was an asshole, but he was a brilliant marketer. The background he comes from, he lived in LA for a while and he, he was uh, the top seller of select TV and on TV when on TV and select TV were coming up. When the cable uh, started hitting the scene, he has the awards to prove it. So he applied his sales knowledge and taught. He said, now what I'm going to teach you is how to teach karate in big groups. It's a technique. Okay. And not no one was, no one was doing it. Okay. So, so basically I caught on really fast. Like the first thing I said is I got to get this guy out of here. Okay. Cause he wanted to show me, okay, now kids and here, look to do, put your hand out like this. I said, Oh, Okay, this guy just did three things that I could split up into three lessons. I already knew what I was going to do. That that is how I met him, and that's how it all started. And once I got him out, and I was left alone, okay, <laughs> now I would bring in the assassins. So okay, so I brought this guy. Everything just fell into place. The thing is, well, it was supposed to be tur- turn karate. Uh, that's what we were supposed to be gearing it towards. Well, yeah, as soon they, as that yeah. dude got out of there, yeah. we're like, nah, we're teaching these kids how to thump. We didn't give a shit about certain kids. No, no. It <laughs> became, so we, we yeah, changed yeah. the format no, no. of what Paul was doing. It um, became apparent. No, 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 no. And that's why it resonated with people because we were doing something no one else was doing. I had to learn what I couldn't do with groups that size. I mean, it's a hell of a, a job to manage a group. I mean, make a group that's think about it. You've got 50 individuals in front of you. I don't care what age. Make them look like something. Okay. And the people who were hired with me a lot failed. Forms, forget it. it. Forget it. I'd start out every class, every beginning class, asking the group with the parents in the room. I'd say, how many of you guys are bothered by bullies? Almost all of them would raise their hand. And I'm going, really? The thing about it, the thing about it is I would promise them. I would tell them, you guys, I'm going to take care of that problem for you. And they would really just, whoa, you know, like, well, what are you all about? Okay, like that. And just and I just tell them, you have to do exactly what I tell you to do. I'll show you how. Okay. And I, you, it's just a trust thing. You earn their trust and you just go from there, man. But basically, that's how I met this man and he had this business and this is what we did with that business. Okay. And it just made it a juggernaut in four cities. Do you know I ignored three of his phone calls? It was like, it was like dude, I got to explain to this guy. Okay. I've got like, man, I started that, that whole place had like 150 students, all white belts. And I said, I know this guy is advancing. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to you know be able to do it, man. But once he showed up and then like, okay, like the story, I'll make it quick. It's basically, I, he was everything I knew. I knew. What he knew, what I, I had a good idea, man, because you know, the guy's a like, Lord, man, he's a third degree red belt. Like, yeah, okay, let's see. He quickly fell in to what I was trying to do, and it was the Wild West at, at that location. I remember my first class, you know, I showed up, you know, after Paul agreed to let me be part of it, you know, and I was like, what, what do you want me to do? Just tell me I'll do it. He's, he's like, you know what, today just line up in the senior position, just be the senior student, just to set an example. And I played, I was. In my traditional classes, I was always one of the senior students. So I knew what that role entailed. And so Paul would ask questions. And you know, you were when I came up, you're expected to speak loudly, um, you know, and kind of in a hard way. So you're like, are you ready? Yes, sir. And like uh, you know, every question I was doing that, like, you know, this, the the other students, this was the teen class, would like kind of start to fuck off. And I'd, I'd like point at him and tell him, like, knock it off and glare at him. And like, you know, the owner came up to me. He's like, yeah, you're going to need to tone down a little bit here. And then as soon as he was gone, Paul was like, nah, keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, okay. Well, let me, I think I know what you were asking me too. I was never promoted. Okay. I was never formally promoted to an instructor. Okay. And I had a problem. I had a problem, uh, kind of an inner turmoil thing. When I answered this ad and talked to this guy, because I said, well, man, like I never fancied myself in being an instructor. I never, I, I never taught classes like that before. Okay, so I said, you know, well, wow, but here's the difference. I don't have to answer to, and I'm not going to say the organization uh, uh, that we had to pay dues to or answer to anyone. Kiss my behind, man. I'm putting food on the table. That's why when you read in the article, you know, Paul didn't want to do this. Paul didn't want to do that. Okay, I, I mean, it wasn't that. I was just an arrogant son of a bitch. 
Okay, it's like, hey, man, I don't have to answer to you, and I got bills to pay. Plus, what I'm doing is working, and that's why you guys are mad at me. It's just the way it was. I work harder than you. I studied harder than you. And I have more to bring to the table than you did. So you're like, love me. You'll love me for who I am, man. Okay, so so once I got over that little hump, no, man, you're in. One thing that was always taught to me, that's one thing that man said to me, when you're in command, command, period. When you're in command, command. You're in charge now, okay? So take charge. And I took charge. I, I had to take over one class in Poway. I go into that class, and it was just like the movie Lean on Me with a, what's his name, man, that went into that high school and all the all drug dealers in school is just, God, man. Okay, table parents playing poker. You got the mom changing the kid with three other kids, a little baby. Nothing wrong with changing the kid, but in the middle of my class. Okay, and then three running around. You got this kid, the teenagers talking, wanting to smooch, and you're like, over here, I'm like, <laughs> Oh, okay, just like that. And then all of a sudden, man, now it's like, you know, I, there were times I just looked down. Here we go. Let's take charge. And so anyway, oh, God, you have to bring in the bad news. You guys, I know you're looking at me. Uh, you know, uh, so-and-so was in, with no fault of mine. He was let go. Uh, uh, just uh, irreconcilable problems with the boss. You give them a generic answer, but they're still going to blame you. Okay, no, you have nothing to do with it, but they're going to blame you. All, all the, you know, so anyway, a few of them storm out. Uh, the rest of them are sitting there looking at me. Now I have to organize the place. I said, guys, if blah, blah, blah. They're not going to listen to me if you're playing cards back there. This is school. I'm going, dude, get out of here. I had so many defections that first time. You start getting hard nosed about it saying, all right, now look, the, okay, now you saw those parents leave. The rest of you guys, if you don't want to do the fair thing and give me a chance, I need you to leave now and I'll wait. I plan to straighten this shit out. So anyway, you feel all alone after that. And, you know, you got a few hanging around. Class is over now. This well-dressed couple approached me, professional couple. He was in a suit. She was in a beautiful pants suit. Can you tell, you know, professional people? He walked right up to me. He said, something tells me that this class is going to be run the way it's supposed to be. We'll see you next week. And that's, you know, kind of spark you need. That That's a difficulty. Take it over for a moron who ran everything into the ground. I remember your aunt's watching you watch the cursing. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> I, I, I told her I won't be nearly as bad as the first one. But anyway, <laughs> All right. you should hear me when I'm talking to her. It hurt me. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. What? I'm kidding. You know, people knew that there was there was a guy, who, there was a tongue studio guy who wore a black gi who didn't yeah, teach forms. And like he was putting everyone out of business. Like that was kind of an ethos around town. And then when we started getting to the Filipino martial arts with our instructor and we started demoing, um, they were able to put like a face to it where they're like, oh, that's him. You know, there was sort of this judgmental look about it. Jesus, um, yes, there was. In the 90s, that's how you pr promoted your school is you did demonstrations. Be like Asian cultural arts festivals, yeah. Chinese New Year's festivals street safety fairs, like any kind of fair, really, any place that would give you a stage, you try to get your your uh, students on stage. Now with YouTube and stuff, you don't really need to do that anymore. And so like, if it was like, say, Chinese New Year Festival, there might be six or seven different martial arts schools demoing there. And so you, were, you started to kind of become aware of who was around you and they started to know who you were. And we were the anomaly, anomaly in our school and then in the larger martial arts uh, world in San Diego because You'll hear us refer to our, our instructor as Sifu, even though we were doing Filipino martial arts. And the reason why is our instructor was predominantly a Kung Fu instructor. Um, we trained in a Kung Fu school, and so everyone in there referred to him as Sifu. We were his only two Filipino martial arts students. And uh, so we, we always referred to him as Sifu, which throws some people off because we didn't call him maestro or guru or anything. So this Kung Fu school would come up, and they would do their stuff, our school. And then he, we were always his opening act. You know, his thing was, uh, you set him up, I'll knock him down. So we were always went up right before him. And he would refer to us as his pet project. And like, we were very non-traditional in our forms. Like we would do these fight sequences and we'd be yelling and stuff. We did this one in the kickboxing ring where my instructor was like throwing us weapons into the ring because he never let us get away with one thing. It was always be like, we'd have to do empty hand, double stick, single stick knives. 
And so it was in a boxing ring. And so like literally he was throwing us weapons and we only had to run around the ring and catch them to fight each other. Well, one of us was catching the weapons, the other would have to do something. And so like Paul went over to the ropes and started beating on the ropes like a professional wrestler, like screaming at the crowd and shit. And like then he turned and like we started fighting again. It was fucking wild. Like I remember that one. This guy came up to us. He said, Man, I've been coming to these fights for years, man. Your show, you guys, that was the most fun I've ever had at one of these, man. That was fucking wild, dude. And like uh <laughs> Our instructor would always make sure that our demos are designed to incorporate all elements. Empty hand, uh, hand to hand, feet, okay? Empty hand, all the weapons, bladed weapons, uh, a knife, stick, quando, staff, whatever it is, okay? Pick up a, a handful of rocks. We did Sikaman against Bunkow, uh, kicking against staff. Paul was swinging a staff at me. And I was doing like, and I was countering with kicks and like, you know, he would like swing at my legs and I'd do a flying spin kick over it. It was just ridiculous shit just to prove that we could do it. <laughs> like no practical application. It was more like just a display of like, yeah, we can come up with crazy shit you guys have never even seen before. Yeah, was Wait, cool. so how, how much of this was like choreographed and how much of it was improvisational, like just straight flowing? Oh, um, so yeah. It would, be, it would be a mix. Yeah. So, um, in the system we came up with, um, we had Carenza, which uh, some systems call it Decadina, where someone throws a strike like a number one and you free counter off of it. And so we would, and we got to the point where there was one time where we actually verbally choreographed a demo walking onto the stage. So we're walking on stage and we're like, okay, we'll do Carenza, I'll take one through six, I'll do, I'll sweep you, go down, you roll out of it, you get up, take seven through two. We did that a bunch of times. times. Yeah. And like, we would literally like, have a never practiced it, right. really go to it. So, you know, the person feeding would be doing a uh, set, uh, set sequence. The person countering would be doing free counters. So Paul wouldn't know if I was going to block that shot or deflect it. So we would never know exactly what position we would end up in. Paul would never know because there was so much free movement. We never knew what position we would end the demo in. Because each time we, we rehearsed it, it would always be different. And so Paul would get so disoriented. He would like be on stage and be like, dude, dude, dude. And he would be like, no. <laughs> It's like we're moving around. We're moving around so fast, man. We would get off. Uh, anything can happen. Okay, like uh, we we rarely have ever uh, dropped our weapons. Okay, that was taboo. No, that so only happened once. Only, I, I can remember the one time. Oh, it you can say that, Oh, uh, you're. Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> no, wait, here's here's a disclaimer. The sound you're about to hear is it? No, I'm just. I'm just <laughs> so this is like. Oh my god. We've done a demo at a tournament, and as we were walking off stage, it's like we're all sweaty and tired because. We used to get paid to ref at these demos. So part of the part of the deal was we had to ref all morning, do a demo, then ref all, ref all afternoon, and then we'd get paid. And so we'd be tired going into these demos. Then we'd do these demos. We'd be exhausted afterwards. So we did the demo, and Paul was walking off stage, and his, his um, my sick, and hot his knee pants, and it, it fell out of his hand. It just Paul slipped did, out of my Paul, hand. Paul did the most brilliant fucking thing <laughs> because all of our students were there. And then you, if you dropped your weapon, you had to do push-ups. So Paul's, he didn't drop it during the demo. He just dropped it walking off stage. And all of Paul's students, we saw him. They were, oh. and we, Paul looked at them and in front of the whole crowd, dropped down and did 10 push-ups <laughs> and picked up a stick and walked off. It was the classiest, most badass way to handle They cheered, man, because it was like, like since they, Paul never drops his stick, but we have it on film. <laughs> Nah, man, no, but there was one that we did. Uh, we opened up uh, our new studio, and Sifu just, just like you unleashed the dogs. He said, "Hey, guys, I'm not going to put any constraints on you. Do what you want." Scott and I looked at each other like little kids, and it's Christmas time. Really? Okay, so it's like, okay, <laughs> look, look, dude, uh, I'm gonna end by cutting your throat, and then you're gonna stick my eye out, and then we, you know, you know, we'll, we'll kill each other in the end. So the thing is, we go through this murderous, uh, we, we just pulled out all the stops. Here it is. Um, I get disoriented. I end up where the kids are, okay, looking at me like, oh, he is a monster, isn't he? Okay, because I got through cutting his throat, killing him military style. It, it's more or less like the demos are the fun we had. What Scott and I did in private, okay, that was a little darker. All right, and I'll, I'll, go, and keep, I'll go ahead and keep it at that. I fought twice in Mexico, and I fought uh, a guy that uh, I fought lightweight at that point. There were only three of us in the division, and we looked at each other, three trophies, three of us. Cool. You know, we just fight each other, and we'll, we'll divvy up the, the first, second, and third. They sent in a middleweight 
to fight in our division. Guess who was first? Okay, so I squared off with this big bear. Okay, and do you know what? I beat him. But there were there were there were uh, four refs in the ring. Okay, only and when I scored the decisive uh, hit, it, what it was, I moved in quick with a reverse punch and I caught him. Okay, um, only one ref st- stuck. It was a clear shot. Only one ref stuck his flag up. They ended up awarding this guy. And the thing is, I knew I won. And and you know, like those guys knew I won. Okay, the guys who came up last. But anyway, the ref that gave me the point walked up to me. Hey, man. I know you won that fight, okay? And that made me feel good. That I, I didn't go home with a trophy, but I felt good. I knew I beat that big son of a bitch. <laughs> and it's supposed to be ranked in California. Ooh, uh, ooh, uh. That's good. I can make seafood gumbo. So what? You're just better than them. And they see in you what they wanted to be, but just can't. And sometimes you pay for it, like I did, when they're in a position of power. Okay, or over you, or it can maneuver things that won't go your way. All right, and, and you just have to deal with it. That's why Scott and I really, oh, okay, man, in all honesty, okay, that's why we murdered those hung bastards. Okay, when we went out and really, if you needed your ass kicked, we went out and did it. Okay, if you needed a lesson, we went out and did it. Okay, it was, it was just that way. We put you in your place because it was kind of like uh, we're quiet most of the time and we were very tolerant. Of, of uh, these people, we know you don't like us, but don't be so vocal. Okay, because we're not saying anything about you. Okay, like, it was like they came after us, man. You know, when you're on the top, it's typical. When you're on the top, they try to knock you down. It's a mind game, okay, depending on how high you want to go. Do you want to be going in the neighborhood, a uh, uh, little karate studio? Oh, it took two semesters. Yeah, well, fine. You look fine to me, whatever. We're, it's our career. Okay, we, you know, I, I made a living out of it, okay, but, but it's fun to do. You know, we met an insane guy. Okay, well, I met a bunch of insane guys, but Lee comes to Scott. Okay, um, you know, I enjoy the craziness. I enjoy the combat. I enjoy the violence. What can I say? We're in a violent world. It's just, you know, I, I'm a, hey, I'll have you laughing, uh, you know, sit with me. I'll have you laughing, you know, all day. But there's the side that they had to bring out of me. Okay, you know, the, the survival side. You have that side, man. That's where, that's where we went. That's what we do. All right, so these are rapid fire questions, all right? Um, stick or knife? Knife. Actually, no. I take that back. I still prefer doing stick. I just got known for knife. Depends on what mood I'm in. Are you more John Kreese, Johnny Lawrence, Mr. Miyagi, or Daniel LaRusso? Uh, well, how about the one we're not? <laughs> <laughs> I was definitely Kreese when I was younger. Like, I was the, I was the hard ass in class, like, I was the one to punish the glass when they needed it. Um, I'm more, I'm more Johnny Lawrence now. I think. Man, I'm creased with a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Steven Seagal or Van Dam? Oh, uh, I do. <laughs> uh, I, I will say this: I am morbidly fascinated with with Steven Seagal movies. Um. I watch clips of that just to laugh at them. There's, yeah, there's typical fights, five on one, and they each take their turn coming in at him. In a bar. Oh, there's a scene I just found from one of the straight to DVD movies where his stud double weighs at least 80 pounds less than him. It's hilarious. He's huge. <laughs> and his stud double, like, it'll cut to him and he'll, like, move, he'll, like, just throw his arms, like, three guys fall down. And then it's, like, a back shot. And, it's 80 pounds lighter. And this dude is like doing these Taekwondo aerial kicks. All right. And then right. when it lands, it cuts back and it all goes oh, 300 pounds of him. God. The whole fight scene is that way. It's, it's hilarious. So for that reason, because it's morbidly entertaining, Steven Seagal. Van Damme, because his movies are funnier. <laughs> uh, the one where he's, oh, wait, wait, what is the one, man? He's, uh, uh. They bring him back to life. He was a soldier. Oh, universe. Oh, dude, I love that movie, man. <laughs> okay, so I'll go. I'll, I get Van Damned. I'm Van Damned. These are not rapid firing enough. That's okay. Uh, well, relatively. <laughs> okay. We're trying. Taco or burger? Taco. Uh, depends on from where. Favorite kung fu movie? Master of the Flying Yu. Oh, God. Hands down. Favorite contemporary martial arts movie? Oh, I don't know. I don't uh, um, I would 
I love Rapid Fire because I was a huge Brandon Lee fan. I'd probably go with that. Even though the fight scenes aren't the greatest, I like the story. I like Brandon Lee. Um, it's nineties, but we'll call that contemporary. It has to be a martial arts flick or, or martial arts in it. Because you know, there's a lot of uh, there's, it's not a lot like of that. actors nowadays that I like yeah. that do it. And then again, stunt dolls and oh, you know what? I don't have one. What is the best martial arts scene you've ever had or you've ever seen? Oh, that's, that's a damn good wow. question. Yeah, that's tough too. Oh man, because there's so many. I mean, like for instance, in Master of the Flying Guillotine. Uh, the actors, I'm convinced, are all masters, okay, because the object is to work towards a tournament, and you get to see each of these people showcase their skill. My God, man, I mean, mean, we're good, but Jesus, okay, these (laughs) dudes, you you can't act doing what they did, and there are no stunt doubles. Except for the main character who wasn't a martial artist. Right, 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 oh, okay, and there is no uh, flying guillotine. Actually, that was a real weapon. That's the thing. I that's was going to say, we own it. Okay, no, so. they, they actually made those in China. It was, oh, God. They, they actually found historical documentation they based it off of. Oh, my that God. That was based on a, on a real idea. I don't know if they ever put it into production, but... Well, I would have one. Mythbusters did an episode on it where they made them and tried them out in school. Okay, so best best fight scene. Oh, my God. And when Bruce Lee kicked Chuck Norris's ass, when Chuck Norris played Colt. Yeah, okay, that, that was beautiful. I love that. Uh, there's um, you know what? We're gonna finish this, and I'm gonna think of like twenty. Oh, dude, seriously, um, <laughs> good ones. Oh man, that's so hard to say. I know. Did you have one? Me? Yeah. You. I'm stalling while I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I mean, I really like the John Wick movies because, like, there's a lot oh, of no Cali in them. I love him. He pays to go. What the hell? Oh, the battery's low. As We're like almost at four back. hours, man. John Wick's cool. He pays in gold. I love the guy. Yeah, <laughs> uh, dude. Uh, I I know there's one that I, I'm gonna f- remember with it. Oh, I know you'll remember, man. Yeah, but it's um, uh, you know, like there's so many. Oh, dude. Um, uh, we'll circle back to that. Keep yeah, going, keep going. All right, um, all right. Favorite kick? Oh. <laughs> uh, jump spinning, jump, uh, jump spinning back kick. Yeah, for me. I, I have a very quick story about that. I'll do this as briefly as I can, but it's a great story and I can't let it go about that kick. God. <laughs> so we had a guy we were testing for black belt. A big, <laughs> big dude, big okay. biker looking dude. Yeah, he, okay. he was tough. He was a talented dude, but part of the part of your black belt test is you should be nervous going into it. And he wasn't. He was like, nah, I got this. I'm not worried about it at all. And we were like, nah, man, this dude needs to needs to confront some fear during his test season. We're gonna mix it up on him. <laughs> Let's do the sparring first. We'll rough him up a bit. We'll jump in there with him. We'll rough him up a bit. Make him fear a little bit. And then we'll do his test because then he'll have some fear in him and they'll have to fight for him. Then we'll do some two-on-one sparring at the end. So first round, I jump in front of him. First thing I do is I crack him in the mouth. And I, I, yeah. I tag him a little bit. I don't go too hard on him. I rotate out. Paul rotates in. Within two seconds, Paul throws a spinning back. He folds this dude in half like a card table. Dude, his I thought Paul fucking killed him. Dude shouted, oh, oh down for like at least five it, minutes ah. it was the most beautiful kick i've ever seen thrown in person uh, uh it was it was oh, amazing god uh and i don't think paul meant to hit it that hard he's kind of I just did. right the guy the guy was barreling in because he wanted to make a statement that he wasn't scared and paul was faster than him and he rushed he, me yeah and he, he, done it. he weren't fast enough and he paid the price uh, for me nowadays that i'm old uh i kicked to the bra <laughs> you're old <either. laughs> Yeah, I'm not getting flashy with it. A rolling kick when I was younger. I was always good with that one. All right. My iPad's going to die. Oh, so okay. we've, got, we've got to do a wrap up. Alice, you're back. so awesome. Thank you for doing this. It's no, thank you guys. Be- yeah, it's four hours of really good talk, and I'm looking forward to part two. <laughs> it was, it was, wait, was it four hours? Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your time. Thank you very okay. much, and nice. we'll talk soon. <laughs> Enjoy right. your day. All right. Thank you. Tell your husband, I'll pay for the flowers. <laughs> okay. Tell him he better give you flowers too. Oh, yeah. Roses.